Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fourth episode of Meet the Professor series. Today, we are blessed with a live lecture from Professor Kathy Bowen. And if you weren't here last week, here are some of the lovely comments that have come through. Leif Notchigal says, both inspirational and lovely to hear your journey navigating the profession today to where you are today. Your comment of knock on doors and never give up resonates positively. Thank you. Paul Heatherfield Jones says, Kathy is an amazing clinician, advocate for the profession, and was a fantastic mentor when I was learning. The future of podiatry and research is as limiting, is limited as the imagination of the academic choosing to explore the subject. Emma Cowley said, lesson after lesson on success from someone who has smashed glass ceiling after glass ceiling. Imagine if there is a job vacancy being advertised at Southampton to work more closely with her. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Bowen is the editor-in-chief of Journal of Foot and Ankle Research. She is a firm believer of engaging the professor in, profession in research through mentorship and teamwork. Professor Bowen has a staggering list of achievements, of achievements which I won't go into too much in depth at the moment. Um, you'll have to catch last week's episode, but in summary, Kathy is the first podiatrist in the UK to be awarded the National Institution for Health Research Career Development Fellowship. Professor Bowen has worked incredibly hard to make, her, make a name for herself pushing past gender stereotypes and using her own negative experience to make a name uh, of being denied professional development. Kathy now pushes uh, women in research and science through the Athena Swan Initiative, proving to be a resilient force to be, re to be reckoned with. Please help me in welcoming an incredible woman of science, Professor Catherine Bowen. Hi, Professor. How are you doing today? I'm very good. Thank you so much for that introduction, Hector. That, that was it's my great. pleasure. You've 100% <laughs> earned it. I'm so excited to see the lecture you have for us today. Okay. Can you see my slide okay if I just check? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I probably have about 20, 30 minutes um, to just, uh, I think Hector and Michael gave me the remit of presenting anything that I wanted so that I thought, wow, um, what a great scope. But actually, after talking with Hector in the interview, um, what I thought would be really helpful maybe at this moment in time was to just explore a bit more about embedding research in podiatry clinical practice, how, how that really has happened over sort of my time within podiatry. And what I really hope to do is stimulate everyone's thoughts on planning their academic career progression as well. So this is the photo of me. This is when I graduated. And, and as you know, from last week and from the interview, I graduated with a diploma in chiropody. So here I am with my mum and dad and my diploma in hand and ready to, to hit the world and go to my first job uh, as, as a, a chiropodist back then. But as you know, over the years, we have changed to podiatry and it's been such an exciting journey. And, and that's what I wanted to start with you uh, this evening. So I think, well, where have we actually come from? Because when you reflect about the advances in our profession over the last few years, it, it is tremendous. And, and I have to acknowledge my great colleague, Professor Alan Borthwick here. Um, he was um, awarded an Order of the British Empire, a really prestigious award for his work with podiatry um, and particular independent practice. But of course, we know him a lot for um, investigating the history of our profession and understanding the profession itself and where the profession sits within the context of the medical disciplines. So I've pinched this sort of um, slide from him um, to show you really where we've come from. And if you go all the way back like 1912, the National Society of Chiropodists was formed. Um, so we're over 100 years ago now. And, and, and um, as that moved forward, that National Society was formed out of need um, for surgical podiatry and as the medical disciplines were, were sort of specialising. And, and you fast forward about 40 years and our Society of Chiropodists um, formed then. And that is what you now know as the College of Podiatry. So that was quite a big step at that time um, to have a professional body that was recognized by the government. 
The next big step for us came in 1960 when state registration um, for professions, and we were then called Supplementary to Medicine, uh, when that act came in, again, that, that registration meant that awards had to be recognised and people could only practice as what was chiropody then um, with that state registration. So what happened from there? So from the 1960s onwards, through the 70s, um, suddenly local analgesia became, it came in as a success for the profession. We became part of the UK NHS system. So up until 1974, um, podiatry was, was largely independent practice. It was not available on the National Health Service. So with those two things, certainly the profession is recognised even greater scale. And of course, surgery then started to advance. So you, once you get the local analgesia access and supply and that ability to do small scale surgery, then um, the profession of minor foot surgery and podiatric surgery evolved. Come to the 1980s, medicines prescribing. Again, we were the only profession to be involved in that. And, um, and all of these things made us that autonomous professional that, that made us distinct from the other professions and from nursing. And finally, for me, the best thing that happened was the degree credentials. So 1993, when the first degree came in for podiatric medicine, I think that was transformed the whole profession and it transformed us for the next um, 20 to 30 years. So if you fast forward to where we are now, um, 30 years on, and, and I have traveled all of that, as you know from the interview. So that whole 30 years, in my time as a as a clinician, as a podiatrist, um, we've uh, we've engaged more in um, prescription rights, um, supplementary prescribing, we've had professional closure um, in 2001, um, which meant that the titles were protected. Um, we've had the diploma in paediatric surgery accepted. Um, we've had our access and supply list extended for prescriptions only medicine. And then I had to put my bit here, the diagnostic ultrasound imaging that we started in 2010. Um, as advanced practice. And I put that really because that is where um, probably in, in about the sort of mid 2000s, when suddenly advanced practice became um, those specialisms and became much more recognised and, and rewarded through the NHS and rewarded in private practice as well um, for those people who, who had gone further to do those advanced skills. And of course, independent prescribing that you all know now, 2014, um, all the way through to probably the last significant milestone for us was the Health, Health and Care Professions Council annotations for podiatric surgery. So again, immense things that have happened in our profession um, in that time, more in the last 10 years. And if you think about allied health professionals in general and nursing, they, they make up more than two thirds of the health workforce. Most of the research, most of the clinical evidence comes from the medics, which is less than a third of that workforce. And the workforce is shrinking. Um, so for patient benefit, we know that as the workforce has become more advanced, the skills are more advanced, the entry criteria are much more advanced than they ever used to be into our professions, then there are there is um, an academic workforce out there that at the moment is probably not, um, not, not really working to the top of the scale in a way and not recognised because at the moment the pathways are a little bit murky and, and it's a bit more difficult to see um, how to get through that pathway um, when you go out to practice. But that said, um, NHS, People Plan 2020, what they want, new ways of working, delivering care and growing the future. This really is the NHS putting its money where its mouth is. Um, it, back in 2012, so we're talking nearly 10 years ago, what they wanted was that research um, was at the heart of uh, decision making in the NHS. But it also applies to independent practice. 
No, this isn't just about the NHS. This is about the best care for patients. And what I put here, you 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 hear Nick Knight on Tomorrow's Podiatry and Emma Cannon in Tomorrow's Podiatry quite regular. Um, they are a great independent practice. Nick, Nick is one of the most um, sort of has the foresight. He's, he's an advanced clinician, has the foresight to work with clinical academics like Charlie and Emma to collect data um, that feeds back into their practice. So just to prove the point that it's not all about the NHS. So, you know, that's clinicians and that's what the NHS says. What have patients said? And this is something when you when you you work with patients all the time, you get feedback from them all the time. And what I found really interesting getting into research was that suddenly we had to have patient and public involvement and they had to feed into our research when actually all along because we're talking to patients and often for about 20 or 30 minutes at a time you get a real feel and a real sense for what the key questions are and that's part and parcel of our everyday practice um, and getting a few of them together just to feed back to help you plan research or help move forward is a really good idea and and they love it and and they are so helpful um, because their voices go quite far when you're trying to um, head down the research route. And what they say about podiatry, having my feet done helps me get around my house. If I can do that, I can stay independent. How fantastic is that, that the skills we have, we can help a person stay independent. There is a shadow there, so, you know, the old saying, every time there is sun out there, there are shadows. Um, one of the quotes I've put here, we end up forcing ourselves to walk through our foot pain in order to manage hip or knee arthritis or other problems such as heart disease. You know, why was that? That was one of the things we went to really look into. Um, why do they force themselves to walk through foot pain? You know, what is happening? Why are they not accessing services? If I have pain in my feet, everything hurts, but my GP will not refer me to podiatry because I do not have diabetes. How odd is that? I mean, who questions that? How do we find out about that? And, and how do we change that? Because we know that we can help that person. You know, we know that if they can get to us and if the GP will refer them to us, then we can help them become that independent person and stay independent. And this, this here really is a quote, apparently, that um, a lot of my students that have come through um, say that I, I use, and that is thinking about podiatry and what you've been trained to do. And apparently, I say this a lot, it is what it is. And, I, you know, and of course, I absolutely believe that podiatry is what it is. And this is Peter McQueen, who's now a musculoskeletal specialist, podiatrist in Oxford. He gave me this notebook. And, and inscripted on the inside cover is, it is what it is. And, and that is, you know, why, why do a lot of people spend so much time trying to oversell or change what they do and, and, and sort of go for things that perhaps don't sort of sit with the bigger picture? You know, when you can help someone be independent with some of the most simple things and skills that you have, particularly when you're newly qualified, but, and then as you advance and you go to advanced practice, those specialisms, again, will help people be more independent. But don't ever let go of what the core of what you've been trained as, which is a podiatrist. And, and do you know what? So many people out there have never learned the anatomy of the foot and ankle as much as you do. That is the one thing we have, all of that, with the diagnostics, with the independent prescribing, that ability to be independent and meet and, and look after patients ourselves it is tremendous. And that's what makes podiatry what it actually is. So where are we going? Where do you think we're going? And this is, um, I had to put this picture in um, because my younger brother, um, we lived in Blackpool, we grew up in Blackpool and on Blackpool seafront was the Doctor Who exhibition. And since he was a child he had this aspiration 
to have his own TARDIS. <laughs> and he always used to go to the Doctor Who exhibition on Blackpool Seafront, him and his little friend, they'd, they'd go there and they'd polish the car, the little Bessie that was out there so they could get free access to go around it again and again. And he finally got his own TARDIS. And we, we just couldn't believe it ourselves um, that he went and he went all the way from the West Country up to, I think somewhere like Newcastle to go and pick this up. And he now has this in, in his front garden, <laughs> um, which is amazing. And uh, I just think it's, it's a really good example of not letting go of your dreams either. In that if, if you do want something, eventually it may come your way um, and you work your way towards it. So there I go. I go into his TARDIS and think, where, where are we going as a profession? What, what is going to happen in the future? And, and for you, graduating, um, it's hopefully going to be a different route. Um, for me and my colleagues, when um, we graduated, um, we then had to, we, you would probably spend a couple of years working in clinical practice. And you would do a degree and your clinical training, you would then consolidate your skills, you may uh, go in clinical specialism, you might do postgraduate degree for example a master's sort of become that real in-depth master of your subject um, and then you may or may not go to be a, a advanced practitioner or if you went in the academic route you may go towards PhD and then um, after PhD you go into your postdoctoral role such and, and head towards um, consultant clinical roles or professor roles so um, all the way through from graduation to PhD, um, I put there 10 to 12 years, but for me, that was 20, that was more like 20. So I didn't get my PhD till, till really my early 40s and then, then moved forward um, with the clinical route towards professorship. What myself and my colleagues did in getting together, and this is Tony Redmond and the Leeds team, we wanted to shorten that. And, and we thought there's got to be a better way to do this um, for our podiatrists. And the new ways of working that we um, tested and we piloted in the early days, um, we worked out five, we could get um, new graduates, really able, um, very talented new graduate podiatrists within five to six years onto a PhD programme. And this was our internship. So this was um, very much uh, funded by Versus Arthritis and we advertised around the podiatry profession for people interested in working with research teams of Leeds and Southampton. And we got some great applicants for that. And, th and this internship has seeded so many real key people. And you think of us as role models and, and Anne-Marie Keenan that you'll hear from in a couple of weeks. Again, she was part of this in growing our interns. Um, and, and we have really grown so many people. Mike Backhouse, who is now at University of Warwick as an associate professor and Lindsay Cherry, who's leading um, clinical academic um, in Southampton, where a couple of our first interns again doing really great things for the profession but they got through to their PhDs much quicker so from graduation and that is just having um, the networks and having the opportunity to almost be springboarded into um, knowing how to do this so I thought well actually how did we get there so in this how and how can you get there um, if this happens? The one thing you have to think of is, is really, it's not a case of what do you want. Um, a lot of the time, if you're going in to try and get funding or you're heading into the research sphere, or you're looking for people to invest in you, they, they will turn around and ask you, well, who are you? You know, what are your values? What is it that you are interested in? Um, what is the point of you? It sounds really harsh when I say this to my students. Um, but what is actually the point of you? And, and people don't really understand podiatry. And I think 
that goes back to Peter's quote of it is what it is. But you have to explain that to people and never get tired of explaining it. Don't feel that you will walk into a room and they will automatically understand what they do. Go into the room and think, well, I'm going to I'm going to educate these people today. I'm going to explain what this is my role and this is how I um, contribute to the patient's independence in the bigger scheme of things. And that's when you're going to talk to, to the medics and the other clinicians that may not necessarily understand what you do. So one of the things you can do as you graduate is just really have a think about that and start to put that in context for you. And I've got three people here who sort of nudged me as well and things that they, they said to me that resonated. And, and this is Mike Potter here who, when I was a new graduate, he was he was the programme lead for the top up degree that I did. And, and this was, um, I think most of my colleagues who know me, they know that this was um, after the top up degree, we would all go and have a drink down in Maxine's in Eastbourne. And we were there uh, just, you know, chomping over the bit, discussing what had happened during the day. And I was perhaps moaning on a bit too much about the professional body or the lack of support around and, you know, what what people do or don't do um, and, and why can't we move forward and, and Mike just turned around to me and he says well why are you wasting your energy complaining you know why not get involved and make the change happen yourself so I was like oh okay yeah okay that's a good response the the next person again that that um, pointed out and and things that resonated um, again, when you're looking is um, at things that are quite not right, or you're looking for people to do things for you in your management, or you, you see things and you question them. And this is David Wiley, who, who is now leading AHP services up uh, in Glasgow. Um, really, I think most people who, who are on Twitter will know David is one of our key leaders in the profession. And, and, and David says, well, if you spot something, then, and, and it needs changing. If not you, then who? So I always thought that's actually a really good question to ask yourself. If it's not you, then who will it be? And then finally, as I got involved in research, then, and, and met Tony, and, and of course we started planning the internship. One of the mantras that, we, that Tony uh, has sort of, really implanted in my brain is when you're planning um, any funding bids is you go people, project, place. So just to take that one a bit further forward, the people bit is work with good people. It sounds really, really obvious. But if you work in a great team um, with great energy, you can achieve great things. And I had to put this picture up because this is the team that I work with who are just awesome. And um, yeah, just to remind you what Emma said is that we are recruiting uh, for someone else to join this awesome team at the moment. But we, we have a great, it's not just us as the academics, um, we have uh, undergraduates, we have interns, we have master's students, PhDs, and postdoctoral researchers working in the team. And everybody feeds in along the whole cycle of the programme and feeds backwards and forwards. So there you go, work with good people. Next advice, project. When you're thinking of projects, think differently. Right? Don't just do what you've been told or always done. Really question, why has it always been done that way? This is um, one of the studies that we did early on. And as well, of course, I love the ultrasound work. I've really enjoyed bringing um, ultrasound imaging into podiatry. But when I married that up with fit pressure measurement, that was my first early engagement in research with my master's project, I thought, well, actually, can we take the foot pressures and look at those in people with rheumatoid arthritis because we know there's this high pressure, but then look at um, inside the foot, use the ultrasound imaging to look inside the foot and see what's going on. And this is the one thing that just created a, a whole new way of thinking because when I looked inside the foot, the erosions and the pathology in these people with rheumatoid arthritis were more lateral. So 
underneath the fifth metatarsophalangeal joint, you have the erosions, the synovitis, bursitis was much more lateral in the forefoot. And here, this was a classic example of the forefoot print where red is the high pressure. So the high pressures are showing up um, underneath the medial aspect of the foot. Without the ultrasound imaging, the natural way of managing pressure there and probably callus there was to deflect pressure. And where do you deflect it to? You deflect it laterally, don't you? And so we were deflecting pressure from the medial side to try and reduce the callus um, to uh, the lateral side that was destabled and um, really unstable with the erosion, unstable with synovitis, without sort of considering the gait of the patient where they'd, done, they'd already adapted their gait to walking medially. And so a whole sort of tranche of us clinicians were deflecting pressure to an area that couldn't take it. So that was a really good um, project, very simple. That was one of our master's projects tied in with the larger programme of ultrasound work. And this one I love because this was um, our shoes project with Parkinson's and stroke patients. And when we were testing the protocol, what we wanted to do was look at indoor and outdoor footwear with these patients who had new neurological incapacity. Um, but we had to test the protocols. So, so of course, when you um, do any research, um, it's better if you test the protocols yourself before you put the patients through it. So the whole team did that. And um, <laughs> I hope you can see my shoes. <laughs> they're, they're not my regular clinic shoes, but um, I have to confess they were actually my daughter's shoes at the time, but they were, they're brilliant red high heel shoes. Never had chance to wear them. The reason we're doing this, I'm tied up to an F-scanning shoe pressure measurement system and we're monitoring imbalance. So this was the one way we could think, well, how, how do they make me walk? In, in an unbalanced way. <laughs> and so we put these uh, massive um, stiletto shoes on um, to see. So again, that was good fun, you know, good fun doing pilot work. Um, but it was part, you know, part and parcel of really testing the procedures for our Parkinson's and stroke patients. Of course, I didn't put them through those shoes. We put them through various, like a, a mini assault course in a way, do, going up and down steps and on balance boards. Um, but we needed to test the F-scan that it could it could do that. So again, in terms of projects and thinking differently, um, also do something that you enjoy and, and you will do it well. So place was the last one here, and that is work with the best people. Again, it all sounds so simple, but as you develop your networks, if funders are going to invest in you and you are going to Dragon's Den to get money, they want to know that you are working with the best that you can. So this is a shout out here for our Centre for Exercise and Osteoarthritis Research versus Arthritis. And this is a collaboration that I am involved in as a co-applicant with the universities of Oxford, Nottingham, Leeds, Bath and Loughborough, um, obviously with Southampton. And this is an amazing collaboration, really looking at um, exercise and sport and um, osteoarthritis development over time. We work across the world. Um, you can see there through Australia, in particular in America, um, lots of colleagues across the world. And because of that network, uh, in 2019, I established the International Foot and Ankle Osteoarthritis Consortium. Now, if you could get your dream team together, you know, if you could think you're setting up something and you want your dream team, you just just go and ask them, you know, because you want the brightest and the best. You want people to um, you want the project to be fulfilled. And in the field of osteoarthritis, there are so many questions unanswered for the foot and ankle. Believe it or not, we still do not have a definition for what is osteoarthritis in the foot. And that is as simple as do you define it as one joint, two joints, midfoot, rear foot, forefoot, both feet, person level. There is no consensus on that yet. So that's what I did. I got together the key leaders in the field across the world to try and solve the, the, the difficult questions that we have. Um, we set up a steering group. 
we had a meeting um, to um, try and um, get more people together um, across the world. The first one took place in Toronto in 2019. Um, and then unfortunately, I missed out on Vienna last year because um, that, that one had to be postponed. But we just had a meeting in May um, and we had a really great consensus meeting. Again, we invited all the people beyond podiatry, that's um, epidemiologists, rheumatologists, the orthopedics were there, um, some GPs were there as well as podiatrists. And we split them up into groups um, to answer key questions about epidemiology, um, burden, treatment of fit away, um, and, and to just try and come up with some priority setting, which we are now writing up as a team. So we'll be, hopefully, we'll be publishing that soon. So those are some really good sort of my top tips in terms of things. And, and it, sometimes I feel like they sound so simple and so obvious, um, but people are willing to work with you um, on this. And so it's up to you, you know, and think about, where are you now? And again, stating the obvious, where are you now? You, most of you are just new graduate podiatrists. You go and you're going to get that podiatry degree, which is amazing in itself. If you think it took me a few more years to get a podiatry degree um, from my diploma. And, and that's what's really, really exciting for you is that there are opportunities out there. And, and there's opportunities to seize. And I, you know, if I was to, to start all over again, it would be incredible, um, the journey that you, you have and the opportunities ahead of you. And what I really want you to think about is when you do go out there is as clinicians, um, whether you are clinician researchers, do you engage in the best evidence for your patient? And this sort of triangle here, it says, you can be a uh, doer of research. So there are people who are the actual researchers, the data collectors, um, you can be a participant in research um, and you can be a consumer of research or you can be part and parcel of all of it. And, and, it, and a rounded clinician really um, is somebody who will have the whole um, of that and, and will be constantly questioning, you know, can I do this better? How can I do this better um, for my patients? What's out there? What new technology is out there? What's coming out there on the horizon? So this is just for you to think about, because I love this. I love this study. Um, chocolate is good for your brain function. And um, think about it another time and, and discuss, because this study um, showed associations between chocolate and brain function. And I thought, actually, that's brilliant. <laughs> um, I would really like to eat lots more chocolate. Um, but when you go and you delve into the study and you look at the sample sizes, you look at the methods they've used, you look at the outcome measures, it, it's a tiny, tiny bit of, of the findings and, and it's, it's um, not quite what it says on the tin. So I'm really sorry about that. But that is for you as a clinician to not just believe everything you read in the headlines and the papers. Try and promise yourselves in practice that you will spend some time catching up, if you can, um, on some of the um, some of the publications that are out there. And um, of course, again, I can put a plug in for the Journal of Foot and Ankle Research. That's a really great go-to journal online, readily accessed. Um, you don't have to pay for it, and there's some fantastic articles on podiatry and foot and ankle research in there. If you think you want to um, test the water um, and, and think about actual clinical research and spend a little bit more time understanding clinical research, uh, Mary Fry here is our program manager. So she manages the allied health and nurse internship versus arthritis for us. And, and this is the one that's morphed from podiatry from our early days as me and Tony um, um, doing that first model, it's gradually transformed and we've we've increased uh, the number of institutions that are involved. We've um, increased the number of interns that come on the programme and we do this every summer. So we watch out for our adverts. They come out about 
every December, January, Mary puts the adverts out. But she's or she or even me, we're always happy to talk to anybody who's interested in applying for the internships. And, and don't forget, they are competitive. Um, so we do a competitive application process. If you have um, had a look and dipped your toes in the water of clinical research and you do want to go further down the route, the National Institute for Health Research has some great pathways. There's funding available for you. Um, and these come in um, fellowship form. And what the fellowships are great at is they don't not just give you funding for your project, but they fund training for you. So they will buy out your clinical time. Um, which of course your managers like because your managers then don't have to fund that. Um, your managers get back full salary for you. And if you look at the pink pathway, that's one that is ring fenced for healthcare professionals, so for allied health professionals and nurses. Um, so that would be the pathway that most podiatrists apply to. Again, I'm more than happy to talk to you about that. And I'm sure um, it's something Anne-Marie would be talking about when she um, presents to you in a couple of weeks time, because Anne-Marie um, is the uh, Deputy Dean for Infrastructure for the NIHR Career Pathways. So what do we do next? Where do we go? And, and that is the exciting bit about our profession is, is we have come so far in the 30 years that, that I have been practicing. Can you imagine where we will be in 30 years time and what we will be doing? And, you know, will holograms be around? What, what will it be about in the profession? Um, and there's always questions to ask. There's always something um, that we can be striving to, to do better. And of course, it's all about our patients. So sort of my final, points to you is is that it really is up to you you know take charge of your career path um, there are people out there there's really good people really good mentors but but in general they're not going to turn around and say you should do this or do that and and i will open this door for you you really have to be proactive yourself knock on the door it will open but unless they know that that's what you want they can't help you Take charge of your clinical research in your practice environment. Really just try and try and have a little bit of time, like I said, to, to see what's out there and, and understand what the latest work is and what the latest ideas are um, in your practice, and um, particularly for your patients. Be proactive partners. So even if you don't get involved in clinical research directly, we are always looking for partners. So if we are um, looking to do a trial, we'd be advertising for partners to help us to run the trial and to, to take that forward. Um, so there's always a way of being involved if you don't feel like you want to be directly that person who's the data collector. And I think these last two are my sort of final points to you is find good mentors. And there are some excellent ones out there. Um, you, you have a profession to be really proud of and you've got some great people in the profession who, who are brilliant leaders um, in their advanced practice, brilliant leaders in research or surgery. Um, and so again, just knock on their doors and um, see, see what happens. And I'm really looking forward to Liverpool in November. It has been cancelled twice, our main conference, um, and that is a really good chance to network. So when you're at one of the key conferences, just really make sure you, you make use of your time and go and chat. Don't be afraid to go and chat to the people um, that you want to. Again, that's my final message to you. And, and just really enjoy what you do because your patients will also then benefit. Um, from that. So Hector, that's my final slide and my final message. And if, if there's any questions, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer questions. That's brilliant. That's such a that was such a fantastic message and presentation. Um, and I think the underlying message, or at least the underlying message that I got from it was it's completely normal to have 
frustrations and fears and just feeling a bit fed up but then mm -hmm. at the same time like don't be afraid to take action like don't be afraid don't be afraid to be the person to make the changes mm -hmm. so i think i thought that was super cool also <laughs> I love that you put your like a picture of yourself in like super super high heels and then we're just like oh yeah my daughter's heel. <laughs> Absolutely love that. Throw her under the bus. It's fine. <laughs> um so I've got a couple of questions coming through for my friends. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just just one friend. <laughs> um what development in the profession has surprised you the most? Oh, crikey. Um <laughs> Yeah, what development has surprised me the most? Um, it probably, I, I, I'm so embedded in the musculoskeletal world, but I think the sports injuries, the thing that has taken off the most mm. in the last few years and, and the way practices have really sprung up that are multidisciplinary, that are looking at lower leg injuries and sports rehabilitation. Right. Um, yeah, I didn't, I, that was one I, I'm not sure why, but I didn't, it was one that's always been sort of around the periphery because the physios did that. But lately the podiatrists have really been forging ahead with that. Oh, brilliant. So if there were, was a certain podiatry student doing her dissertation <laughs> in sports injuries, who yeah. could she talk to? <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you know yeah, Trevor Pryor is our, is one of the gurus. Um, Nat Padia, um, obviously Nick Knight, who's been on Murray's Podiatry. They're, they're, okay, they're, <laughs> yes. <they're> like, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, before we start, uh, kind of going further into the the questions, mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about something you had mentioned before we started the live today, which was you had gotten a lot of responses and feedback from yeah. revealing your grade. <laughs> what was that? What was the feedback? Well, I, it was more surprise, and 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 it it was interesting because it was the the responses were thank you for being honest <laughs> about it, and and I think I forget the pressure on people these days who who want a first and and I do get a lot of students come to me and say sit down at the beginning when they start their programs is that I want a first oh. and you say to them well, what is driving this because you know you, you're going to get a degree and a degree is like part of the top percentage of the population anyway yeah um, why what is the pressure to get a first um yeah, and, and that was what I was surprised at, is that response. Because a 2-1 mm -hmm. like, is a very good degree. That's how it's graded. It's very good. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's amazing. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I, I know we talked a little bit about this before, but uh, mm -hmm. there's so much competition. And I think just, and even like outside expectations or external yeah. expectations, like you've got parents that are rooting for you, you know, mm -hmm. spouses and partners that want you to get like a really good grade. So I think that disappointment adds in as well. Like, it, well, if I don't get a first, I'll be disappointing my mom, my partner, my friends, my dog, like everybody will be so disappointed. <laughs> so I feel like it's, you know, it's just so lovely to hear from a professor that a 2-1 is great. Yes. It, the two one is brilliant and never never undervalue it at all um and a degree is a degree at the end of the day you know yeah. how privileged are we to have that qualification that's so true that's so true um for the next question we've got here it says you mentioned patient involvement in research how mm -hmm. do you think it has changed about the way you approach podiatry um hearing the patient voices um Often, often they, they come with something different, you know, their perspectives about what you're doing and what the big questions are sometimes don't match. So as a yeah. clinician, you know, I had ideas. I did have ideas of where I wanted to be and, and what, what research I was going to do. Mm. And I suppose the biggest influence was when I started looking at osteoarthritis. And I, and I didn't really understand the fact that people with osteoarthritis couldn't access our services because I've been used to working with inflammatory arthritis in the acute care sector. Right. Yeah. And so it's when as soon as I started to include PPI and they, they were able to help us develop that um, funding bid um, again to find the answers to those questions um, about mm -hmm. why they can't access services. 
And do you think that's made like a profound difference, just making that extra step? It, it did because again, I was able to pass that data to the to the College of Podiatry, mm -hmm. and that's been used now to inform policy. And it and it and a lot of people now are using that because it's really good data. It's really rich data that mm -hmm. is believable as well. That that the politicians will believe, um, and that's why it has to be done well so that it's believable at that level. Um, so that so that then they will commission podiatry services, and and you can see that commissioning starting to come back um, again in the NHS. And I hate course, to ask this question, but is it does a majority of this have to purely do with funding? Um, it's really difficult to do research if you don't have funding. Um, so. But there is fun, you know, there's a lot of funding out there that is directed that the medics go for. Um, so I suppose the example is if you don't have funding, how will you get the time out to do the work? And if you're always doing it around the edges, um, it's going to take a long, long time. So to yeah. answer the really key questions and, and to help the profession progress, it's better that the person is bought out to do that. Okay. And to do that, you need funding for salary. And that is the biggest cost. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it makes sense. It's just mm -hmm. sometimes when things get rejected um, mm -hmm. purely because, you know, a, a lack of funding or people can't have jobs for a lack of funding, it's really, really disheartening. It, it kind of dampens the whole spirit. Yeah. Oh, it does completely. And um, we were talking about that yesterday in a, in a meeting in that what we should do is we want to have a session so the grant I never got, <laughs> I had loads of rejections. <laughs> and um, they, they reckon one in 10, and some of them can be quite harsh, but in general, the feedback is is, is okay and you can work yeah. on it. Do you ever take it personally? Like, do you ever feel <laughs> like it's a personal rejection? Or sometimes when it's... <laughs> 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 yeah, but you can't really. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have to I've got a, for a few days. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is why we have wine, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, wine and gin. Very good. <laughs> there you go. Um, I've got a lovely question. Now, I think this is part when you mentioned the doctor who, um, the, the thing, I don't know what it's called. I'm not a Doctor Who person, but it says, it asks, um, if you were if you were the doctor, what part of podiatry would you like to visit? You were the, oh, you mean the, the work we did with the clinical practice research data link? Is that what they mean? Um, no, they mean like if you were, if you were Doctor Who and you had to oh, like- Oh, sorry, if I were, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> no, if I was, where would I go? Um, do you know, I really would like to go into the future. Um, okay. I would like to zip on 30 years time and see a world where we, we have this amazing profession that is doing really great things and, 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 and patients are active and mobile and, and that's when we know we're doing our job really well. <laughs> <laughs> do you ever think we'll have any kind of like crazy technology when it comes to podiatry, like something so unimaginably innovative? We we will do. You know, I'm working with a PhD student at the at the moment who's using our MRI scans um, to model um, in cell materials around the forefoot and, and model where the skin health and and um, skin tissue is going to be um, uh, is going to be problematic. <laughs> and if you can, and and all we talk about is in that where that can go. You imagine that probably even in ten years. If you're modeling that now in 10, 20 years time, someone just puts their foot in a foot scan and you've got this algorithm from the engineers that will say, well, actually, if you do an insole this way or a shoe that way, it's going to create an ulcer. You're not going to do it. And then you can tweak it. So yeah. you can tweak the model and you can just print the actual insole straight away for the patient. <laughs> and it's not going to rub cool, yeah. you know, or anything. <laughs> Beautiful. So I think... I think that's all the questions we've got for you for today. <laughs> Thanks for letting <laughs> me pick your brain and everybody else. Like, thank you so much for participating. Um, it was such a great lecture for me today, Professor Bowen. And thank you so much for being a part of the Meet the Professor series. Be sure to join us next Tuesday at 8 p.m. where you get a chance to meet Professor Mike Edmund, 
who is he? Well, you, ha you have to tune in next week to find out. Mm -hmm. Be sure to tune in this Friday, uh, 25th June at 7 p.m. to find out the winners for tomorrow's podiatry awards and feet in three. Thank you so much, guys. Have a good night. Okay. Thank you.